Hi everyone, welcome to the class once again. I hope you are all doing good and in the best of your health. I believe that you have watched all the lessons of this chapter nuclei because that is quite required for this exercise. Now after practicing this exercise, you will find that this chapter is quite easy and you can easily score in this chapter. A few basic concepts that are in this chapter which will be quite helpful for you all to score in your board examination. Let's go ahead and practice question based upon this chapter nuclei and the first question of the day is it's a one mark question as I have told you regularly CBSE has mixed mark pattern questions. First one, what is the relationship between the half life and mean life of a radioactive nucleus? Half life and mean life. Let me tell you how half life and mean life is related to the decay constant. Half life T half is equal to ln2 upon lambda that is what relation we know and T average is given as 1 by lambda that is what we know. So it's very easy for us to mark it out that T half is equal to T average multiplied with ln2 or ln2 if we know it's 0 0.693 so 0 0.693 into T average that will be the relation between both kind of time T half and average life the mean life that is what we can make out from this. Next thing. Let's go ahead with the next question of the class. Question number 2. Two nuclei have mass numbers in the ratio of 1 is to 8. I believe that you all can see this data. What is the ratio of their nuclei, nuclear radii? Two nuclei have mass numbers in the ratio R 1 is to 8. Now I believe that you are remembering how the radius is related to the mass number. We all know that R equals to R naught 8 to the power 1 by 3 where A is the mass number and R is the radius that we are talking about nuclear radii and A is mass number that is the total number of nucleons present in the nucleus. Now what do you do put up the values now see it is given that mass numbers in the ratio 1 is to 8 what is the ratio of the nuclear radii mass numbers in the ratio 1 is to 8 so A1 by A2 is given as 1 by 8 so if I write radius of first to radius of second R0 R0 will be cancelled out. So this will be a1 by a2 power 1 by 3 or you can say this is 1 by 2. So the radii of both the nucleus will be in the ratio of 1 is to 2 for this particular set of data that has been provided. Hope that it is clear to you all not too tough for us to understand. And let us switch to the next question of the day. So we have done some basic one mark question, this basic basic formula I have used in such one mark question and that is what CBSE is actually looking for that you have actually thorough enough your basic concepts in each chapter. 3 to 5 is 2 mark question, next come 2 marks question. In both beta minus and beta plus decay process, the mass number of nucleus remains the same whereas the atomic number Z increases by 1 in beta minus decay and decreases by 1 in beta plus decay, explain giving reasons. We all know I have told you in the equations of beta decay, I have told you what happens in beta minus, what happens in beta plus. If you have watched the lesson, certainly you can arrive at the right result. Now beta minus and beta plus decay, if I take any kind of, let us say I have taken an element given as, uh, let us say, let me take the element as x and a and z are the mass number and atomic number related to this. Now if the decay is let us say beta minus. In beta minus you see that z increases by 1. So in beta minus let us say the I am getting the result as y a will remain the same and here I have beta minus dk so beta minus 1 will here and the mass sorry the atomic number will increase by 1. This is what we are going to have. So in beta minus dk z increases by 1 in beta minus dk this is what the reaction is. There is actually a loss in electronic charge that is what we have that gain in atomic number we have here. Now after this if the kind of decay is beta plus. So we are going to have a decrement in atomic number by factor 1 in case of beta plus decay. Because we can say that proton is lost and one positive charge is lost so that is why it is a beta plus decay and in this case there will be an increase in sorry there will be a decrease in the atomic number as you can see here there will be a decrease in atomic number in the case of beta plus decay. Simple simple logic I, as I have told you all in our regular classes.
Now after this let me tell you some more details, some more questions based upon this. Let us go ahead to the next question, question number 4. In a given, given sample, two radioisotopes A and B are initially present in the ratio of 1 is to 4. The number of active nuclei of A and B are in the ratio 1 is to 4 that has been provided. Make it out from this statement. The half lives of A and B are 100 year and 50 year. Half life of A is 100, half life of B is 50 that is given in years. Respectively, find the time after which the amounts of A and B become equal. So, initially let me mark out that N naught of A and to N naught of B is given as 1 is to 4. Simple data I am putting down. Two radioisotopes A and B are initially present in the ratio of 1 is to 4. The half lives of A and B are 100 year and 50 year. Half life. T half of A is 100 year and T half of B is given as 50 year. Find the time in which the number of nuclei of A and B becomes equal. That is what you have to find out. A and B become equal. Time, let us say after T time it disintegrates. You see here A is lesser, its half life is more. B is more, its half life is less. So, A will actually try to understand with this data. A will actually disintegrate at a lower rate. In 100 years, it is reduced to half. But B, in, in 50 years reduced to half, in 100 years it will be reduced to 1 by 4th. That is what we can make out. So, if I use n equals to n naught e to the power minus lambda t in both the cases. So, after some time t, let us say, let after time t, the number of nuclei of A and B be, become, becomes equal. Let after time t, number of nuclei of A and B becomes equal. So, what I can write? I can write that n naught of A, n naught of A into e to the power minus lambda a into time t that is going to be same. So, time t I am using the same is equal to n naught of b e to the power minus lambda b into time t. That is what I can make out. I have t half comparison. I do not have the comparison of lambda a and lambda b. Now, you all know that in such cases when you have t half, you see if I write lambda a lambda a that will be 0 0.693 by t half or I can write ln 2 by t half. So, I can write this as ln 2 by 100 for lambda a and for lambda b I can write ln 2 by 50. Whenever I will be using that I will be using it here. Now, you see n naught a by n naught b is 1 by 4. So, if I write this down n naught a by n naught b and if I take this term here I will be having e to the power this term will go, it will come plus lambda a minus lambda b into t. This I have term taken here, so it will become in this way. n naught a by n naught b 1 by 4 and let me rub down some data so that we may reach on to answers here. So, I'm, I have used this, so I am rubbing this part and I need this one, so I will be keeping it here. From here I am writing down, here. I am writing up here, so I will be having 1 by 4 is equal to e to the power lambda a minus lambda b. So, lambda a you see here, it will become ln 2 by 100. Lambda b, it is quite simple for us to make out, it will be ln 2 by 50. You can easily make out, I am ok, I will write down here, lambda b will become ln 2 by 50. Clear, now let me put down the data, e to the power lambda a minus lambda b, so ln 2 by 100. minus ln 2 by 50 and here t. That is what we are going to obtain. Now, think about this. Think about this term which has been given on the left hand side. All these parts we have used. So, I am rubbing this. Let us go ahead and put it down here. This can be written as 2 power 2. So, let me put it later on and here I will be having e to the power 1 by 100 minus 1 by 50 and ln 2 will be here. I will be having 1 by 100 minus 1 by 50. So, that will give me minus or 1 by 100 
minus 2 by 100 into t that is what we are going to obtain. So, e to the power ln 2 and here I will be having 1 minus 2 minus 1 by 100 into t and all the data you are having here. If you solve this, now you see here, here you are having ln 2, ln e basis here. So, if you solve this, you will get the value of t. It is not too tough for us to make it out. Here you see e to the power ln 2. So, I can, what I can do? I can use it and I will be obtaining t will be equal to 200 years. We need to just solve this equation. Above equation, we will find out that t comes out to be 200 years. That is the required time in which the both the numbers, both the element number of active nuclei will be actually same up to 200 years. So, all this you will get the required result for this. Simply put all the data, you will be getting the required result. Next question after this. Question number fifth. A radioactive nucleus A undergoes a series of decays according to the following scheme. A changes to A1 with alpha decay, changes to A2 with beta decay, then again alpha decay, then gamma and then A4 is formed. The mass number atomic number of A4 are 172 and 69. What are these numbers for A? So, you have to find out the mass numbers and atomic number for A. Very, very simple. I am going to use a very simple logic or sort of use just beneath here only so that you may obtain it very easily. I believe that you all can see till here. A, let us say A goes as X and Y I am using. Now, when after alpha decay, what happens? 4 He2 actually comes out. So, mass number will be reduced by a factor 4 and this will be reduced by a factor 2. Then you see beta decay. When beta decay is given, it's, it means that we are talking about beta minus. We are talking about beta minus decay. So, A2 is formed. So here, this term will increase by a factor 1. And this term will remain same, x minus 4. It is a beta minus decay. Then again, after A2, A3 is formed with alpha decay. So, what you do? A3 and x minus 4 minus 4 again. And here, you have to do y minus 2. y minus 2 plus 1. So, we will get y minus 1. And again minus 2. Then again for A4 gamma decay, no change in mass number and atomic number. X minus 8 as mass number, Y minus 3. That is what we have obtained. So A4 is given that A4 mass number is 172. So X minus 8 is 172 implies that X is equal to 180. And next you see. 69, the atomic number is 69. So, y minus 3 is 69 or implies that, I will write it down here, y is equal to 69 plus 372. We got this, we got the mass number, atomic number. So, mass number comes out to be 180, one answer for A, atomic number comes out to be 72. Such simple basic questions can also be asked. So, if you are thorough enough, what happens in such decays and what happens to the mass number, atomic number, you can easily reach to the result. That is an easy thing, not too tough for us to make out. Let us go to the next question, question number 6. It's 3 marks question, define the term activity of a sample of a radioactive nucleus, write it as SI unit. Activity, the rate of disintegration, that is the activity. So, let me write down here. It is a very simple definition can be also asked in your examination. Activity is actually rate of disintegration and one disintegration per second, that will be the unit. Unit used is 1 disintegration per second and I will tell you what it is also called. This is 1 becquerel, BQ. 
one big QL that is the one disintegration per second that is also the unit used to express the activity of any sample. Let us go ahead with the next part the half life of uranium 238 undergoing alpha decay is 4.5 to 10 power 9 year. This is what we are going to have. Now, determine the activity of 10 gram sample of 238.92. Given that 1 gram of 238.92 contains 25.3 into 10 power 20 atoms. We have to find out the activity, how much active samples are there. Now, see here, first of all, half life is given as 4.5 into 10 power 9 year. Half life, 4.5 into 10 to power 9 year such a big big half life can you can make out a billion of years 100 billion years it's actually it's nearly that approximation that you can make out so quite long that means uranium whenever it's present somewhere it will take billion of years to actually get reduced to its half of, half of its value that's why uranium is today also it's found in its natural state now again undergoing alpha decay is this much 4.5 in 10 power 9 year that is what i have mentioned here determine the activity activity means sample how many sample of nuclei are present there now from this data, can you make out the lambda value? Lambda is ln2 by t half and ln2 is 0.693. So I can write down 0.693 upon 4.5 into 10 to the power 9 year. I have to find out n equals to n0 e to the power minus lambda t. Given that 1 gram of, now see, determine the activity of 10 gram of sample of uranium 238.92 given that 1 gram of this much contains 25.3 in 10 power 20 atoms. So, for these many atoms, we have to find out the activity. Now, you see, we all know that activity, if I term it as dn by dt, and this is proportional to n. So, I can write this as equal to dn by dt is equal to lambda into n. lambda into n or activity can be given as lambda into n. Now, lambda you have 0.693 by 4.5 in 10 power 9 year. Into n, capital N that is the number of active atoms. 1 gram has this much, so 10 gram will have 10 into this much. So, you have to write down 10 into and 25.3 in 10 to the power 20. Only thing is left that is you have to calculate the values that I have actually used. So, if you calculate, you will get nearly 1.24 into 10 to the power 5 with proper SI units. This is what you are going to get for the given sample per second. The number of samples per second, that is what the activity we are going to find out in this particular case, that is disintegration per second, or you can write down the QL. 1.24, it is 1.24 in 10 to the power 5, calculate it, you will get this required result. So, only I am using basic, basic formulae for each calculation. And I will also request you all to solve it on your own. Then only you see the particular solution. You solve it on your own, you will find that it is quite helpful for you all if you practice on your own. Next question, question number 7, define the terms half life, average life and form the relation between the decay constant. Now, half life is the one in which the active number of nuclei is reduced to half of its initial value. So, half life I just I have also defined it on regular class. Half life, it is the active nuclei, the time taken for half of active nuclei to reduce, to disintegrate, for half of active nuclei to disintegrate. Okay, that is what the half life and if I talk about average life, 
average life is actually the ratio of the you think about i have talked about the average life in our regular classes and average life if you remember it's the ratio ratio of the total time that will taken to disintegrate all the atoms with respect to the number of atoms that we have taken average life total time taken to disintegrate all atoms although as per equation all the atoms will not be disintegrated but we are talking about the limit when it will be very much nearly reduced to zero value time taken to disintegrate all nuclei with respect to total nuclei present in the sample total nuclei present in sample its derivation is not required at your level its derivation is not required uh, you can use directly the equation that how average life is 1 by lambda and half life already we have derived the half life in our regular class so i will use t half is equal to ln2 by lambda or 0.693 by lambda because i have also derived in our regular class if you have watched the video you have seen its derivation i believe that you can recall that now not too tough also for us to make out that so we have done the relationship with the decay constant for both the cases second part a radioactive nucleus has a decay constant this much how long would it take the nucleus of decay to 75% of its initial amount no big d for to solve the second part half life is given from that sorry lambda is given so easy for you all to make out decay to 75% of its initial amount 75% has decayed so the remaining part will be 1 by 4 or let me just clarify the question statement at saying how long would it take time it is asked the nucleus to take the nucleus of to decay to 75% of its initial amount that is initially if you take n not and 75% has decayed so finally the left part will be 1 by 4 of n not 75% has decayed that is what you can actually make out from this next thing lambda is given you have to find out the time n equals to n not e to the power minus lambda t you can use this term or you can also use that n equals to n not 1 by 2 to the power n or you can also use because two half lives would have been passed here you have to use two here you have to use two and here you can use it now suppose if i use this because it's asked for time it has been asked so first of all what you do Two half life would have been passed. You can use directly. I have used because seventy five percent has disintegrated. That means two half life would have passed. So number of half lives n is equal to two. That's very easy mathematical thing. So lambda is given as point three four six five per day. Per day, t half you can make out. 0.693 by lambda two half life you have to find out just multiply 2 into 0.693 divide by lambda that is again 0.3465 per day so days i am taking here now from here you can easily make out you can easily make out the required result and if i have to make out this will be somewhere around 4 days you can actually make out you can see here it's 34 it's nearly 68 so you can make out it nearly 2 times 2 into 4 days so 4 days will be the required result as per the given data you can see here lambda is given so you can easily make out here so what you do take note till here and i will reach to the next question or the next part take note till here okay now one more thing in this question that you may think that how long would it take the nucleus to decay to 75% of initial value you should also make out this statement correctly that it has been mentioned that 
75 percent of the nucleus has decayed that means three fourths has decayed and one fourth part is left that is what we have done so how long would it take the nucleus to decay to 75 percent actually how long would it take the nucleus so that 75 percent nucleus so that 75 percent of its initial amount has decayed you may add for clarification this part that is required here okay now let's go to the next one so i believe that now the statement will be quite quite understood by you all and that will make the calculations also easy if you think that 75 percent is left the calculation will be quite tough next one let's go ahead with the next question question number eight write the relation of binding energy in mega electron volt of a nucleus of mass this atomic number z and mass number a in terms of the masses of its constituent namely neutrons and protons binding energy for this again it's not too tough for to find out the binding energy binding energy i have told you you see how many neutrons how many atomic number z and mass number a so total number of new nu nucleons will be a total number of protons only will be number of z in terms of masses of its constituent namely neutron and protons so if i talk about mass of neutron if i take that will be a minus z into mass of neutrons plus z into mass of protons minus mass of the nucleus that is m a z that is what you have to make out multiplied with c square equals to mc square i'm using this will be the binding energy which i have discussed in our regular classes hope that you are remembering that now draw plot of binding energy per nucleon versus mass number a for a2 to 170 use this graph to explain the release of energy in the process of nuclear fusion of two light nuclei so not too tough for us to make out this second part also see here graph which we have discussed let me write down in terms of mega electron volt fifty hundred one fifty 200 so if you can see this from your in your given textbook also it will be given the graph in this way now if i start with hydrogen if i start with hydrogen this will go somewhat like this hydrogen helium and then it will go here then lithium here then again oxygen here come down in here then here in this way you need to also just verify so hydrogen will be somewhere here then you have 2h then here you have the helium here you have lithium now let me talk about the oxygen part this has to be a bit raised and then you have oxygen 16 oxygen 18 and then it goes in this way for it 150 touches here this is how it varies this is for ferrous fe56 i have here the mass number and here i have the binding energy per nucleon given in terms of mega electron volt this is how the binding energy varies you also refer to the exact curve in your textbook that will be required because i might have made somewhere up up and down so you can also refer there also in the textbook So draw plot we have done up till 170 so we have used till data till here it will come somewhat like this 
Use this graph to explain the release of energy in the process of nuclear fusion of two light nuclei. Two light nuclei when they fuse, see what will happen. As they fuse, you have to talk about binding energy is what? The binding energy of the or you can say mass of product minus mass of reactant into C square or whatever the binding energy has to be less of the product compared to the binding energy of the reactant. So, more energy will be released. In that case, the binding and solid energy is released in the case of fusion. Next thing, so if you have the thorough concepts in you, then only you can solve such kind of questions. Question number 9. Define the Q value of a nuclear process, Q value the amount of heat energy released. So, I am not going to talk more about on that and heat energy released whenever the fission takes place or fusion takes place, the energy released that is the Q value of the process. When can a nuclear process not proceed spontaneously? The nuclear process cannot produce, sorry, cannot proceed spontaneously if the product of the mass, sorry, the mass of the product is higher compared to the mass of the reactant then there will be no mass defect, no mass defect, then there will be no energy release. So, no energy release, so it cannot be spontaneous. If not the number of protons and the number of neutrons are conserved in a nuclear reaction, in what way is mass converted into energy or vice versa in the nuclear reaction? Now, see if mass of proton and mass of neutron is not conserved. So, if there is a mass defect, that is mass of product is less than mass of reactant. So, energy is released energy is released, but if mass of product is higher than mass of reactant, in that case energy won't be released. There will be no mass defect. Here there is a mass defect, that's why energy is released. Vice versa, energy is not released, this process is not spontaneous. Hope that you are getting the oral explanation which I am telling you all without writing. I believe that you all can make out from this. Ninth question, sorry, tenth one after this. Draw a plot of binding energy per nucleon, just now we have drawn, so you can refer to that. For a large number of nuclei lying between 2 to 240, I have drawn, you can refer for the curve that was going after 170, it was going to the bottom part. Now, using this graph, explain clearly how the energy is released in both the process of nuclear fission and fusion. So, again in this question, first of all, you have to see that how energy is released. If the, understand, if the binding energy per nucleon, binding energy is what? Suppose the nuclear breaks the nuclear breaks, so energy will be released, the binding energy is going to be released. And when the binding energy is released, if for the reactant part, it is more, if for the binding energy of reactant is more compared to the binding energy of product. So more energy will be released when the reactant breaks. And again, you have to give energy, energy is actually, you have to give energy for the product to be formed. Then, if that is less, if that is less, the reaction will be exothermic, it's a spontaneous reaction. Same applies for fission and fusion, this thing you can use. And also, I have actually explained this concept in our regular classes also, which you can actually make out if you have referred to all the video lectures that you have seen in our regular classes. Hope that you have understood all the concepts in this practice session. It will be of great help to you all. I will advise you all go with the theory on your own, see about the binding energy, see about the curve of binding energy per nucleon, basic basic concept but that can be utilized in your examination. Hope that you find this class helpful. Practice more questions for your own requirement, for your own help. You will find that it will be a good one to do that. Do practice more. I wish you all the very best for your preparation. Thank you everyone. I will meet you all in the next class with some more concepts and explanations. Thank you everyone.